Hello and welcome to this podcast about climate justice in Uganda. I am Wambi Michael on behalf of Interpress Services New Climate Justice Project. Can we sue our way out of the climate crisis? What role should judges play? I will take you to one of the cases in Uganda in which victims of landslide disasters sued their government, the country's environmental body, NEMA, and their local governments. Why is it important to train judges about climate justice and litigation? We have had instances where judges are not well informed in relation to environment or climate change, and that is the whole importance of the trainings that we carry out. We want to impart them with the knowledge. Because these cases are coming up, there are cases that have been filed in court in relation to climate justice. So when you find a, a judge is not informed about these concepts, they may not be able to make a well informed decision. Climate litigation is an emerging field of environmental law that predominantly addresses climate-driven issues from cases against governments for violation against human rights to those against corporate greenwashing and non-disclosures. While some of those cases have been common in more developed countries, Africa is slowly catching up and in Uganda, there are some of those cases awaiting ruling in court. So what role should courts play in climate justice? Bridget Ampurira is a lawyer with Greenwatch Uganda, an NGO specializing in environmental advocacy and public interest litigation. Courts are very important. In order to get justice, we need a route to be able to get that. And I believe courts are the best mechanism of getting that, especially where you have where you have like a large number of victims that have been affected either by an individual or by a natural disaster. Courts are very essential in um, finding a remedy for such victims. So they are very, very key. There is an emerging consensus among the country's judicial officers that courts can make a meaningful contribution by providing equal access to justice, determining and not deferring climate change claims, upholding the rule of law, taking and forcing the executive, the legislature and the private sector to take climate change seriously and promote environmental values. Here is Justice Richard Butera, Uganda's Deputy Chief Justice. You have factories being built in swamps. You have farms that are reclaiming farms. You have waters that go down as a result of human activities. And people want to use the land irresponsibly. We have to balance between human needs for now, but sustaining the environment for the future. Because in the effort to maintain the environment, these conflicts have to be resolved by courts. And the training is for the purpose of making clear the position of the law. Justice Richard Butera, the Deputy Chief Justice of Uganda, you have heard him speak about training. The Judicial Training Institute in Uganda has worked with environmental NGOs like Greenwatch to train judges on environmental law and climate change law, and generally climate justice. Why is the training of judges or judicial officers crucial? Samantha Atukunda Mwesigwa is the director and legal counsel at Greenwatch, a Ugandan NGO specializing in environmental advocacy and public interest litigations. Several disputes are being brought up in court. Uh, concerning different environmental challenges and violations. So it's important to have a judiciary that is knowledgeable and equipped when it comes to climate aspects, in particular climate justice. Samantha Atkunda Mwesigwa. Bringing together 10 also judges in one room for training on climate change was initially not easy. Some judges had little or no knowledge about climate change 
and environmental laws. Others had dealt with cases related to the environment, like pollution, but they were blind to the human rights aspects related to the environment and climate justice. Bridget Ampurira sat in some of the trainings and witnessed that firsthand as she narrates. Of course there are those instances or judicial officers who will point out the fact that they, they are skeptical about climate change and climate justice. So they will point it out and they will question us uh, as to the reality of climate change. But then there, most of them will actually they will not and identify the experiences that they have seen they have, that they have seen in the newspapers in relation to the, the landslides or the floods or the rising water temperatures. So there are those who understand or have seen and realize that actually climate change is an issue that needs to be tackled. Yes, there are those judicial officers who will ask and they'll be skeptical about the issue of climate change. And they wonder where we are getting our concepts or how we know if it is real or not. But then there are those who, Id who recognize that actually climate change is an issue. And how has it been like with the judges that you've trained? What has been the outcome? Fortunately, there has been progress. The training started in 2019. Uh, that in 2019 we trained about 18 judicial officers. Uh, as of last year, we trained about 36 judicial officer, officers. Which um, so uh, when you look at 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, up to 2023, we have cumulatively trained 122 judicial officers. And of the judicial officers we have trained, um, there are few where our cases are before those judges. And we, there has been progress in the way they handle the cases. For example, you find most cases, when we file cases, um, they don't understand. They will uh, try to delay the progress. But we have had, um, I can say, in regards to the court procedure or court process, there has been a great improvement in the way they, um, in the attention accorded to the climate change cases. So yeah, there has been great progress, we believe. And the more we train, because we want to train 100% of judicial officers, I don't know how long that will take, but that is our goal. So by the time we have trained and they have this information before them, we believe we'll, when we, these cases come before them, they'll be able to make better decisions and we'll see great progress Yeah, in the way that the attention accorded, because even attention is key. Mm. Yeah, If a judicial officer is not interested, okay, that is their role to hear cases, but if they don't have the concepts before them, they may not be interested in that case. What has been the response of the judiciary in Uganda as regards to this new concept of climate justice and the fighting for climate change through courts of law? Mm. They welcome, they are very positive, they welcome the trainings, mm. yeah, because every, at the end of every training that we hold, we usually have an eval evaluation form and they will note that they will say that they, uh, they learnt a lot and they hope to have more training, so it has been a very positive for us uh, in the way that judicial officers have welcomed the trainings. The judiciary in Uganda has realized how crucial such pieces of training can be. Speaking at the opening of the 2023 training, Honorable Justice Damari Luanga, the director of the Judicial Training Institute, said the fact that climate change is a global issue, it requires intervention from all relevant stakeholders, the judiciary inclusive. And indeed, the narrative is changing. Judges are realizing that climate change cuts across all the arms of government and the private sector too. Here is the late Ugandan Court of Appeal judge, Justice Kenneth Kakuru. 
Is government liable if uh, for failure to implement obligations in international agreements? For example, who is liable when children? You have seen children with water up to here trying to go through a flood from school. This flood takes a child, or even a person. I think there was a woman who, who was washed away from her car or something here in Kapal after a flood. Who is liable? If the government has not, uh, uh, has not complied with its obligations. Because for me, I am on mitigation. I am on mitigation and issues arising from mitigation. We owe it ourselves and the citizens of this world. We owe it to those who, from whom we inherited this beautiful place. We owe it to our children and their children, to those yet unborn. The time to act, my lords, your worships, ladies and gentlemen, is now. For tomorrow, may be too late. Let us not consider our individual contributions to be insufficient or insignificant to make any meaningful impact. Every positive action counts. Nothing is too small or insignificant. The ocean is but a collection of single drops. That was Kenneth Kakuru. He had served as judge from 2013 until his death in 2023. He believed that, that judicial officers should be conscious and alive to cases brought before them for some are of commercial nature, yet they are actually a result of climate change. Climate change mitigation is a tool that has the capacity to influence government policy and legislation. It also has the potential to influence corporate behavior towards self-regulation and voluntary compliance. Without judicial interventions, laws are likely to remain only on statute books. Vigorous enforcement is key in addressing climate change. Public interest litigation is also a key tool in the enforcement of existing and future legislation. Judicial intervention is likely to influence positive change in present institutional and legal framework. Justice Kenneth Kakuru was one of the founders of Green Watch, which began with public interest litigation and then took on the mantle of training judges about climate and environment issues. What role should judges play in relation to climate litigation? Here is Judge Lydia Mugambe. I think the role of the judiciary is a very, very important one in um, matters of the environment. And we, as the judiciary, should take it on with gusto. It is a very, very vital role. We cannot underscore it. It is very important. The change that we are advocating starts with mindset change. We need to change our mindsets. We need to separate politics from the real issues when cases come before us in order to do justice. I think there is also to understand the role of public interest litigation in matters of the environment. Now, in, from my experience in the courts, a case can be brought straightforward as a public interest litigation and they present it as a public interest litigation. But there are cases that come as individual cases, but they are public interest litigation cases really because of their nature. So when determining these cases, what kind of remedies do we give? You could give remedies in individual cases that have that effect of reforms so that there is change to prevent other cases being brought. So we have to understand the nature of public interest litigation, whether brought as public interest cases or individual cases that have the effect of public interest. I think there should be the base minimum below which we do not go for purposes of environmental protection. There should be that base threshold below which we can, below which is unacceptable. I think we need to know the nature of, the, of obligations of the state for environmental protection from the international system, regional and down to the domestic level. The obligations of the state are clear. I think we, we need to appraise ourselves on 
how to assess duties and obligations of the state in regard to environmental law. But we also need to be mindful that there are also obligations and duties on the citizens, the public, the you and me, outside us being in the courts. That is Lady Justice Didia Mugambe, a judge of the High Court in Uganda. As you have heard from Justice Mugambe and the late Justice Kenneth Kakuru, judicial officers must be equipped with sufficient knowledge of the environment and the law itself because climate change litigation will not wait for judges to be trained. One of the organizations that has filed the most cases about environment in the form of public litigation in Uganda is Greenwatch. IPS spoke to Bridget and Purira to shed light on some of those cases. Greenwatch has filed several cases related to climate change, one being the case against uh, Greenwatch versus uh, the Attorney General and NEMA, which has been dubbed the Nisibabazi case. This, this case was, was filed by four minors in, together with Greenwatch, and it sought declaratory and injunctive reliefs against the defendants, arguing that Article 237 of the Ugandan Constitution makes the government of Uganda public trustee of our country's natural resources, including its climate. As such, the government has failed to protect and sustainably manage those resources from degradation culminating into climate change and its negative impacts. We, the plaintiffs, allege that the government has breached its, its constitutional obligations and also violated the citizens' right to a clean and healthy environment and as well the right to life and the right to property. So that case uh, essentially comes in to protect that plaintiff's rights, which includes children, mainly children, against the impacts of climate change. So that is one of the cases. The other case that we have in court, uh, I'll take you back to the case that I was just discussing, Nisim Babas. It is still pending in court as well. It was filed in 2012, and I believe that 10 years have passed, and we're still, we haven't yet even gone to trial stage. So that's a long time yes. of waiting for yes. justice, yes. and that is climate justice. Climate justice is denied. Yes. We may call it injustice yes. from the courts this time around. Yes, mm. uh, in relation to the time that it has taken in court, it is really an injustice because they say justice delayed is justice denied, which is uh, Greenwatch versus Attorney General, the National Forestry Authority, and NEMA, which we, have, which we dubbed as the forest cover case. Now, this case uh, contains the defendants who are mandated to protect, preserve the environment and natural, for natural resources, specifically forests, have failed to execute their duties by failing to curb forest cover loss in Uganda, as a result of illegal, unregulated trade in forest products, expansion of commercial and subsistence agriculture in forest lands into other land uses. If judges are not sensitized, if the lawyers don't uh, understand aspects of climate justice, the victims will always suffer the effects without any form of compensation and thereby their rights will be, will be abused. I wouldn't say that the courts are not effective. I would just say maybe there are challenges that they face in regards to coming up with the, the sol or remedies for these people who have been affected. So one of the challenges that us as an organization has faced while uh, advocating for maybe climate justice is at the, is the delay with the justice or the court system as it, has, as it is characterized with concert and judgments, both from parties and as well the court. So you find that a case that would take a year to be settled or decided takes more than 10 years. For example, as we noted before, the Nisim Babazi case. So maybe we would advocate for the government to maybe come, uh, establish an environmental court where it handles such cases that are related to environment and climate change. As we know, climate and environmental issues are very urgent and they need to be decided immediately. So I find that a case takes 10 years in court, they, really there is no justice there.
you have heard and pleaded a speak of the Environment Court on 16th July this year, the Land and Environment Court in Kenya awarded the equivalent of $13 million in compensation for the devastating impacts on the climate and the health of the community caused by lead poisoning from a nearby smelter that recycled batteries. A similar case is before the High Court in Uganda, but this time around involves victims of landslide disasters in Uganda's eastern district of Ududa, located on the slopes of Mount Elgon along Uganda-Kenya border. On 3rd December 2019, a major landslide occurred in Uganda's eastern district of Ududa. Twenty people died and others were injured. The landslides caused damage to property and the environment. As a result of sustained government inaction, 48 people who were directly impacted or lost family members in that disaster took their case to Uganda's High Court. They allege that by failing to act on known landslide risk, the Ugandan government violated their right to life, property, and the right to a clean and healthy environment. IPS asked Bridget Ampurira to speak about this particular case and why it is important that victims of such calamities be compensated. I would love to first credit B and B advocates because they were, they were the first on the case. We took it on after it was filed in 2020 and the applicants who are the victims of the landslides in Bududa district filed a suit against the Attorney General and the, the National Environment Management Authority and the Bududa Local Government Council alleging that the respondents have failed to put in place effective mechanisms against landslides in Bududa and that the respondents' act and omissions have led to the violation of applicants' fundamental rights, including the right to life, right to property, and their livelihood. You find that uh, people in, for example, in Bududa, those ones that were affected with the landslides, they are they lose their property, they lose their source of livelihood, and because of that, they're unable to continue a more productive life. Therefore, we need to recognize that these negative impacts need to be addressed in terms of the adaptation mechanisms to be able to, to, get, to, be able to live a more sustainable life. The case popularly known as Sama William and 47 others is the first in Uganda where victims of climate change related disasters have sued the government asking it to comply with the several articles of the Paris Agreement 2015 and articles of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The government, the National Environment Management Authority and the Bududa District while accepting that they had obligations under the Ugandan constitution and laws like the Paris Agreement to protect victims from climate change and its effect, they instead blamed plaintiffs and other residents of having contributed to the landslides in the area through their poor activities like poor agricultural practices, vegetation clearance, and poor cultivation. They said they had issued advisories and warnings about the likelihood of landslide disasters. But Peter Chibeti, a survivor, disagrees that landslides in this area were human-induced. Uh, the landslide has not been the issue of, destro of destroying uh, trees, but it has been due to heavy rains. The water has sunk into the soils. It has reached the major rocks underground. They are now weak, and the water is just coming up because of pressure. That's why it's moving, but it's not because we have cut down a lot of... We still have many trees in Bududa, yes, and account of even. I can, and see, we still plant. Acro, I can see a lot of... Yeah, and you still plant? Yeah, we still plant more trees, but much as they say that we plant trees, it will also be affected. I cannot believe that cutting down trees cause land, landslides and mudslides. It's because the soils has been weakened by heavy rains in Bududa. That is Peter Chibeti. They have not significantly contributed to global warming, but they are suffering. Bududa has become one of the most dangerous places to live in Uganda. Over the years, some experts have warned of an unprecedented rise in temperatures and extreme rainfall. Information from the Ministry of Disaster indicate that over 400 landslides have occurred in that district 
in a period of 10 years. You may be wondering why this place is vulnerable to landslides. Are they human-induced? Dr. Yazid Mbamutaze is an associate professor in the Department of Geography, Geoinformatics and Climate Science at Makere University in Uganda. In Bududa, if we are to look at the area specifically, you realize that uh, that part of uh, mountain Elgon is vulnerable to landslides and uh, we've had previous cases and there are a combination of factors that uh, lead to the occurrence of landslides in this area. The slope gradients, when you go to those areas, the slopes are quite steep. In some areas they go over uh, 80 degrees. Then you also have um, the climatic factors, particularly the rainfall. It's an area which uh, receives a lot of rainfall. And if you look at the data for most of those places, you realize that annually you get over 1,500 uh, millimeters of rainfall. But it's also an area which is very productive in terms of soil, so that attracts uh, settlement because when people cultivate, the yields at the end of the season are quite high. So you get a combination of those factors that always uh, trigger the occurrence of landslides in that area. That is Dr. Bamutaze from Makerere University. Whenever landslides have occurred in this area, the government and agencies rushing with the relief items. Once rescue efforts are called off, the victims are left to fend for themselves. No early warning systems, no compensation for losses suffered, no tangible livelihood restoration support are rendered. For some, this is one of the country's deepest injustices. Patrick Meru is a politician in this area. You know, we have mostly depending on the center giving us and our budget for the district is close to 24 billion but out of this we have not received the money for disaster so we had to go this mercy because the local revenue we have nothing we only put a budget line should there be a good friend a donor that can come to our rescue otherwise the, the disaster budget is 100 shillings, a token figure, to show that there is a need. But where do we get this? The policy in Uganda is, in every district, we have a chief administrative officer who is the chairperson of the disaster management. But with no budget line. IPS previously reported about landslides in Ibududa, we asked the then Commissioner for Disaster in Uganda why it appeared that like nothing has been learned from past landslide occurrences in this area. Martin O'War. This year we have had 67 landslides. 66 of them was effectively managed and thus there were no deaths. The 67th people have died. We are going to have the 68th landslide, I know. We are going to have the 69th. What I don't know is whether people will die in it or not. I don't support this idea of giving me money when the disaster has occurred. That's what they call contingency, getting money from the contingency fund. You get after the disaster has occurred, and then you are running all over the, the 1970s, the 1960s approach of waiting for a disaster to occur then resources are made available. Then you run around with the coffins and the vehicles are moving at high speed and flags on it and doesn't help at all to see 100 vehicles moving at a speed of 180 kilometers per hour heading to Bududa. What are you heading for? Stones have already rolled over the people. Whether you are driving at 150 or you are driving at 30 kilometers per hour, you are not going to rescue a life. Martin War. Going by this, do victims of disasters in Ibududa deserve justice? It is hoped that the ruling in Tsama William and 47 others will set the first precedent in climate justice in Uganda. And hopefully, the Paris Agreement will begin to bite. I am Wambi Michael, IPS Climate Justice Project in Uganda.